Right before we jump into this video, if you'd like me to send you a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations, just look for this orange box over on the website. Put your name, email address in it, hit send it, and I will send you that guide for free. Jared Poland Fronos Photo. Dot com and this is a review of the Nikon 51.2 for the Z mount line of cameras. This is Nikon's first 1.2 lens for any of the Z mount cameras. Now it's not their first 1.2 ever, but it's the first for the new mount. Now before I get too far in this review, I do want to tell you that I took it out into the real world. I photographed 1900 ice cream at their facility to get some portraits, to get some photojournalistic candid things, but I also took it back out to the hemp farm because it's beautiful light. It was a bright sunny day. I was in greenhouses and greenhouses have the best filtered light because the sun hits it and it just softens it when it goes inside. So I had some really good shooting environments to test this lens out on the Nikon Z7 II. This is the Z6 II over here. I did not use that for this. I used the Z7 II. Now that we got that out of the way, let's take a look at the lens right here. This is a big lens. You've got your lens hood. I always recommend that if you have a lens hood, you use it, whether you're outdoors or indoors. I always use a lens hood because it cuts down on extra stray light and gives you a little bit more contrast and it might protect in case you drop it, but please don't drop your lenses. Don't use your lens hood as a way to stop from breaking it. Do I put a filter on the front of this lens? The answer, Steven? No. No. Is it because it's expensive? No. no, it's not because it's expensive. It is an 82 millimeter filter thread. It's because I don't want to put a piece of glass in front of some of the best glass that Nikon's ever made. That's just the pure fact. I don't use it for protection. I use other things for protection, but I don't use filters on my lenses because I don't want to degrade the quality, even if I'm using the best of the best of the best with honors, sir. So this is the lens. It is massive. Speaking of massive, this right here, this is the 24 to 70. This is the old 24 to 70. Look at how much it dwarfs it. Here, I'll put the lens hood on just so you can see. It dwarfs it inside, and this is just a 50. So get out of here, 24 to 70 that I never used because I sold all of my DSLRs. But taking a walk around this lens, you have your OLED panel here. It's a panel that I just turn off. I don't ever personally use it. I know some people do like using it. So if you do like it, it is there for you to use. You do have a switch on the side to go from autofocus to manual. That's if you want to go ahead and control that right here. You could also control that inside of the camera. You've got your display button here that controls what is showing on your OLED display. You have a custom button right here. You can set that to whatever you want to set it for. This is your manual focus ring. You also have this ring right here that's on all just about all of the good Z lenses. You can use it for manual focus if you wanted. You could use it to change the ISO. My camera was already set to change the aperture and I absolutely hated it because every time I picked up the lens it was going from 1.2 to 1.3 to 1.4 and I was just accidentally turning it so I went ahead and turned it off but other than that that is the lens there's not a lot going on on the outside of this lens but it's what's going on inside that matters it has nine blades do nine rounded blades mean anything to me Stephen no. no not really but to put that in comparison Sony's has 11 blades and Canon's 51.2 has 10. Do I think it matters? No, I don't care at all. This lens is absolutely fantastic. We're going to get to sample images in just a moment, as well as sample video showing you how the autofocus is working with this lens and the Z7 II. But being that I just mentioned the Sony and the Canon 51.2, let's get those out here right now and just show you a size comparison. That is the Sony 51.2 and this is the chode of a 51.2 from Canon. Let's talk about the length of these lenses. Now the Nikon comes in at 5.9 inches. Now looking at it right now, I'm like 5.9 inches. That looks more like nine inches. That's if you take into consideration the lens hood. So it's without the lens hood, it's 5.9 inches. The Sony on the other hand is 4.3 inches. It's so dainty and tiny. I guess this is where size doesn't really matter for some people because smaller may actually be better in this situation. And then the Canon is 4.25 inches. So the big question is why is Nikon so much larger? I don't have the answer to that. 
I own this personally, the 51.2 from Sony. We have a loaner here from Canon with the 51.2. I have no idea why the Nikon is so much larger. Does it make it better? I don't really think it makes a difference because I love what I'm getting out of both of these lenses as of right now. Now, in terms of weight, the Nikon is 2.4 pounds or 1,090 grams. The Sony is 1.7 pounds or 778 grams. And the Canon is 2.09 pounds or 9 950 grams. Again, the Nikon wins on size and size alone. Now, when Nikon came out with the larger mount, they talked about smaller flange distances and the way they could shrink their lenses and make them smaller, except for the fact that this lens is massive. Why isn't it smaller? Did they take like an F mount kind of design and then throw some sort of Z adapter on the end of it and integrate it? Because look at these other two. I mean, the Sony is so small and so compact and so light that I want the smaller one at this point. I mean, for me, it's lighter. It doesn't take up as much room in the bag. And this Nikon is absolutely huge. And when you have a lot of older Nikon shooters, and it's true, we know that there's a lot of older Nikon shooters. Do they want something this heavy? Will their arthritis handle it? Too soon? I don't think it's too soon. It's just something to keep in mind. It is a massive lens. All right, let's get these other two lenses out of the way real fast. I wanna talk about the multi-focus system because the Nikon has two focusing motors inside of this 51.2, which should help it be a faster auto-focusing lens, but a lot depends on the system. Maybe on a Z9, it will focus even better. Maybe on a Z10, 11, or whatever else they come out with, it will take advantage of whatever they decide to come out with at a future date, because right now we know how the focusing systems of the Z6 II and the Z7 II work. It's not my favorite, and I'm gonna show you some examples in just a minute of why it's not exactly my favorite. We're talking about the focusing system right here. Also, there is no IS inside of this lens. You have no image stabilization. Is that a big deal? Not really, because you have awesome image stabilization inside of both of these bodies. But let's look at some sample images. The first image that I'm gonna show you is at 1900 Ice Cream. This one employee went into the freezer and I like getting pictures as people are walking out of doors, which means the system, the focusing system needs to acquire them quickly as they open the door. It needs to find their face, find their eye, and as they're walking, be able to track them and get the photos. And in this situation, I think it did a very good job of finding her, acquiring her as she came out and taking a bunch of pictures as she was walking. Is it super tack sharp? It's pretty darn close. I don't think anybody looking at it would be like, you didn't nail it. I, would, I wish it was slightly a little bit sharper, but I think it did a good job in this particular situation getting the shot. Now, some people may say, Jared, why are you shooting this at 1.2? And it's simple isolation. I want to isolate the subject from the background. Now, I don't always do this, but you notice a difference that if you were shooting at 2.8, it just looks more snapshotty because everything is going to be in focus. In this situation, she's isolated from the background, but you still know what it is and it nailed the shot. Moving on, we have a really tight portrait right here of the owner of 1900 Ice Cream and it absolutely crushed the focus on this. We nailed it. And he's right in front of a window. There's a lot of light coming in. Uh, it was soft light. And with the 50, which generally isn't a portrait lens, you know, it's not the lens that you're gonna use for portraits, but it is a good photojournalistic lens. It is a good lens that you'll use at weddings if you're a wedding shooter. It's just a nice lens to have in the bag, especially if you can afford it at $2,096.95. It's still a good lens for professionals to have around. So it absolutely crushed with this shot. It looks great. And I love the tones and the colors and the sharpness that I get out of the Nikon systems. They are some of my favorite raw files ever. This next photo right here is gloss black sitting in front of the mural that he just got done painting here at the Fro Factory. There is a video that we did showing you all about the painting that he did in six hours with his spray painting to get this awesome mural. So I was like, let's get some portraits with this. The colors, they go boom. The colors look fantastic off of this. The sharpness, I mean, it's super sharp. It's super colorful. The tones are great. I absolutely love what I got out of this. This one looks fantastic. Let me jump in here real quick because I want to show you Fro Pack 3 in action on this photo right here, starting with Fifth Element. Fifth Element looks great, followed by Canadian Tuxedo. Then we've got Capone. 
Then we've got King Contrast, which gives it that cool contrasty effect, followed by MDMA and Prestige Worldwide, which is kind of universal. But check this one out from Fropac One. We've got one called Universal Soldier that gives you a really good starting point. So if you're looking to speed up your raw workflow or give yourself a great starting point, we created 15 all new custom Lightroom presets that you can check out right now at fronosphoto.com slash Fropac3. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters. And if you decide to pick them up right now, they are currently on sale. Or if you'd like to grab Fropac One, Two, and Three together as the triple play bundle, you can save even more. Now, let's get back to the video. Now, so far so good. It is a it's a great lens. There's no way around it. This is a fantastic lens and I would expect nothing less for a lens of this caliber from Nikon, especially when it's their first 51.2 and they expect to have an 85 1.2 at another point. But let's go out to the hemp farm. I've been to the hemp farm before. That's when I took out the the Sony A7C and it was fantastic out there with IAF and lock on tracking and I actually took out the Nikon Z50 to test out a lens and I just had not a lot of luck with the IAF and face detect at that time. That, that It just wasn't working very well for me at the hemp farm. So I wanted to go back with the Z7 II in hand and this 51.2. This right here is of course a picture of a hemp plant. It is growing. They haven't taken off the buds just yet. Now before anybody says, oh, did you get high out there? One, I don't like smoking weed. I'm not a big fan of the drugs. But what they're growing here is has very low THC content. It's more for the medicinal purposes and it's used for different things. And they have a website, you can check it out. It is down below, it's also up on the screen. But you can't really screw up a picture like this. I mean, it's at 1.2, it may not be something that you always shoot at 1.2, but it looks perfectly fine. This next image is just a basic portrait. Uh, Kate was doing some work inside of one of the, the big garages and the light coming in looked great. So I got this portrait of her and it's super sharp right on the eye. The IAF did a great job finding her. It's not like she's moving very far. It should do a great job finding her. So that's a great image. These next two are pretty cool too, because this is in one of the greenhouses where you can see that the plants are starting to grow. They're pretty small, but in a matter of a month or two, they'll be fully grown and ready to be trimmed. Um, I just, I love this angle. I love getting this shot at 1.2. And when you zoom in on him, you can see that his eyes are absolutely tack sharp in this one. Now it's a little more difficult with him because he's squinting and his eyes are a little bit in shadow, but every system in this day and age should be able to find the eye and lock on without a problem at all. So for this particular shot, it did a good job finding it. Now for the next shot, I just stepped in a little closer. I like being able to work with a 50 millimeter. I mean, you have to move your feet, you're not zooming, but you're not gonna get that 1.2 effect with anything else, of course, because it's not a 1.2. So I love how it obliterates the background, but you still know exactly exactly where you are and what you're shooting. So when you have time on those weddings to use a 50 millimeter, it's going to come in handy. But now I wanna break out a video of the EVF because I record the EVF for everything that I do just for these review purposes so that you can see exactly what I was seeing and if the autofocus was doing a good job or not. So let me break out this video and take a look with you. All right, so I have the video queued up right here. I'm gonna work through this with you. We're gonna start, we're gonna stop, we're gonna let it play through. There's some longer clips, but I think it's important that we show these and just let them roll and talk about it. So in this first situation, they're setting up one of their last greenhouses. So they're taking all the wood and they're setting it up, getting ready to bring in the plants, the saplings or whatever they call them. And so when I'm telling a photo story, I want to get all of the action that is going on. And it's not, I say action, but this isn't like fast moving action. This isn't sports, this isn't football, this isn't basketball. They're not running around, they're just moving around. So watch what's happening. Right here, we've got the continuous autofocus going. I'm allowing the camera to find the face. I have on face detect and IAF. That's what I have on. And that's using the entire frame. So it's continuous autofocus and letting the camera do that. Now, Nikon offers you a couple of different options. Another one of the options that they added that some people seem to really like is you can use a smaller box that you can move around that finds the face and then it will find the eye inside of that box. It's a little smaller. But 
remember, you have to move that box with your finger as the subject is moving. And I rely fully on the Canon focus and the Sony focus at this point without having to tell it where to look 99 out of 100 times. And in the Nikon, I'm trying to shoot it the exact same way because I can do it with the very inexpensive A7C. I should be able to do it with the Z6 II and the Z7 II. So let me show you what's happening right here. You can see that it is not acquiring his face at all. It's using these red boxes bouncing around. It's not finding his eyes. And yes, he's got sunglasses on, but you'll see right here, it finds the eye ever so slightly for up oh, there it does for a quick second, but then it's gone. Now it's not like he's not facing the camera. The camera should at least know where his face or head is. Even in this same exact situation, the Sony and the Canon would do it. Right now with the Nikon, it is not. You're watching what it's doing, and this is making it hard to take pictures. I end up missing shots because I'm like, well, it's not in focus. Why would I go ahead and take the picture? Now, the next scene is trying to get this portrait inside of the greenhouse because I loved the soft light being diffused from the greenhouse. I loved the fans behind Cam, Cam, his name's Cameron. I love the fans behind him. I love the symmetry of the lines right down the middle. The 50 is a perfect lens for this situation. And so let's hit roll. Now you can see I'm at one five, well, one four thousandth of a second. My histogram looks really good. Now is his face as bright as I would want it? No, but I can bring that back later. If I'm off by just about a stop or less, that's fine because I also want the exposure for the background here and the Nikon files have a ton of detail that I should be able to bring back. Actually, I can bring back because the Nikon files are tremendous. I'm at F2 because I'm having trouble getting focused to be tack sharp. Look, it's not finding his face. It's bouncing all around. And this is where I switch from the all autofocus, where the camera is making the decision, finding the face, and, and I switch into the dynamic area AF, which is more of an old school way of shooting. Now, I know there's a lot of people out there who have been harsh on my reviews that I've been doing and, and saying that I've been unfair to Nikon or that I just don't know what I'm doing when it comes to using Nikon. I know what I'm doing when it comes to Nikon. If I can do all of these same things with a Sony and with a Canon and get fantastic results time and time again, but I can't do that with the Nikon, do you think there's an issue with the Nikon? And the answer to that is absolutely yes, we're looking at it right now. Watch what happens. I've got the dynamic area, oh, ooh, 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 look at this. I have to physically move that box over to his face. I'm still at F2. I'm trying to get his face in focus. It takes me forever to move that focusing point, which is taking me longer to get the shot, which means I may be missing something that's happening, and by the time I move the focusing point, the shot is gone. And that's why I love the Canon system, and I love the Sony system at this time, because I'm able to capture images that I otherwise would be missing with the Nikon. That's the point. So let's show you taking a bunch of pictures, taking a bunch of pictures, all right? Stepping a little closer. Same thing. I'm gonna open up to 1.2 now, but how do we know that we're gonna hit the eye, and we're not gonna hit the ear, or we're not gonna hit the nose? The answer is, we don't know that. We have no way of knowing that if we're gonna use the dynamic area AF because it's just gonna go where the camera thinks it should go. So let's jump into the images and take a look at where it went. So I, I love the black and white tones. Man, does Nikon do a fantastic job when I go black and white. I love the symmetry of the shot. What I don't like is that it is almost impossible to know whether he's in focus or not. It is not super tack sharp. It does not present itself. But with the other pictures with the Nikon at 1.2, you know they're in focus. You just know. So the next shot, similar. We can't really tell if it's tack or if it's the ear. But the next one is where we absolutely know that it's the ear. We zoom in and you can see that his face and his eyes, they are not sharp, they're in a blur, they're in a haze, and it's not because we're on a weed farm, because it's a hemp farm. Maybe one day they'll be on a weed farm, but it's a hemp farm. And look, the ear is in focus, and I took seven pictures in a row where the ear was in focus, and that is not a good thing. Now that's not saying that the lens is bad, because the lens 
is fantastic. The lens can only be as good as the focusing system. And if the focusing system is holding everything back, it doesn't really matter how good the lens is. Now let's jump back into another picture. So this is Cam walking out to one of the greenhouses. Uh, the autofocus had a little bit of trouble with this one. And yes, my exposure was off slightly. He does look dark in the viewfinder when you're looking at it, but when you edit it up, the file handles it tremendously well, even being off by a stop. But the autofocus only picked up the eye a little later on when he was super close to me. Now, you could see the red box blinking the whole time trying to find him. It's not like he's running down this aisle way. It's not like he's moving super fast. It's just having trouble. And I don't want to hear, oh, but it's backlit and he's in shadow. Because I know for facts that the Sony and the Canon nail this time and time again. Just put yourself into a situation similar to this. We have an aisle. Where else do people use cameras that there's aisles. Weddings. If you have one shot to get the bride coming down the aisle and you're never able to lock on at all because the red boxes are just bouncing around, can you trust the system? The lens could be the greatest lens in the world, but if you cannot trust the system to time and time again get you the images that you deserve and that you need at this point, because the system, the focusing system, just doesn't track well, regardless of what mode you're in. I don't wanna hear that you should be going into dynamic area AF and going back to the old school way of shooting. If, the, if I wanted to go to the old school way of shooting, I wouldn't have gone mirrorless cameras. I would have stuck with a D5, and I would have used that with a subject walking down the aisle. But when you shoot at 1.2, you're doing it because you can isolate the subject, and you can, with mirrorless cameras, nail the eye at 1.2. We've seen it with Sony and we see it with Canon. Back in the day, if you tried to use a 51.2 Canon or an 85 1.2 Canon, even on the latest 1DX Mark III or on something like a 5D Mark IV, you could not shoot at 1.2 and get anything in focus tack sharp. It would, it would be a miracle if you got one of those in. They're either, soup, they're either slightly soft or they're totally out. It just was not easy to do with a DSLR. And that's why mirrorless technology is amazing. You don't have the back focusing issues because you're focusing right on the sensor. But if the system can't keep up, you end up with shots where you're like, oh, well, Cam's not really in focus, so the bride's not gonna be super tack sharp coming down the aisle. That's a real world situation where people would be using a Nikon like this. Let me jump in here real quick and remind you that the super huge mega camera giveaway for 2021 is officially live. Now I'm giving one of you the chance to win $4,999 worth of camera gear for free from me and it, it's free. Head on over to bit.ly slash megafro2021 for your chance to get entered. Also, if you purchase Fro Pack 1, 2, or 3, or the bundle, or you already own any of the Fro Packs, you will score extra entries. Now, let's get back to the video. The next two images I wanna show you is where a subject is entering a door frame from being out, and the camera's having a hard time finding them, where it's not even finding them at all. It doesn't acquire them. Whereas, when I have someone like Jesse Ito, who is a sushi chef, a sushi chef? down by the seashore, he opens up the, the, the freezer and his eye just showed up for a quick second and the Sony nailed it. Yes, it was an A1. Yes, that's his great camera. But the A7C would do the same thing because they both focus and nail it time and time again. They nail it more than they miss. And that's all that matters because I can't move a focusing point fast enough. And I wanna use the technology in these cameras to the best of their ability. They're there, why should we resort back to old school ways of shooting? So for this image, he's not tack sharp. The subject trying to come through the door is not tack sharp because the focus could not be acquired. And it's not like he's super backlit. And that shouldn't really matter anymore because because like I said, the Canons and the Sonys do it repeatedly. Anybody who has an R5, an R6, or any of the Sonys knows this for a fact. And the reason I bring up the next image is we got the focus right on cam. Uh, he looks great. This is great. I love the black and white, but I don't like that my composition is off. The reason my composition is off is because I had to move the focusing points around. And when I have to concentrate on moving focusing points, then the camera can't be still. I can't be focused on moving points and also making sure that my composition is perfect. That's why it's not. 
but I noticed that my compositions got even better when shooting with mirrorless cameras that allow the focusing points to go right to the face and right to the eye, because now I can concentrate on capturing the moment, but also keeping my composition the way that I want it. I'm not being harsh just to be harsh. We are looking at the samples together. You're seeing it in real world situation, not working like it should be working today in 2021. Now let's jump back into the video situations. So here we are, uh, I'm at 64 ISO, F1.2, 1 thousandth of a second. We're outside now, it's slightly shaded, and you can see that the, the face detect and IF is doing slightly better here. It's finding him, he's not moving super fast, but it's, it's, it's there. Sometimes it misses his face, and then you end up with the red boxes, but then it reacquires. This is one of the, and then it loses it. But of course it's gonna lose it if he, if he exits the frame. But here it's doing an okay job. We need to do better than just an okay job. So here, let's fast forward around to here. Because look, now it's on his arm. It doesn't even know his face is there. We're trying to get it. There he's smiling, nailed it, nailed it. Good, fine, good. It worked okay in that situation. Not perfect. Even moving to the side, here it doesn't even acquire an eye at all. At the very end, it gave us a little bit of his face, a little bit it acquired there. But can you trust it in a situation where you need to move fast? That's a question that you need to answer yourself. We got a couple more clips right here. This is a situation where you're like, I'm shooting at 1.2 because I wanna isolate him from the background. This is a great working shot. Now, you can see that it's not finding his eye, it's not finding his face, it's using those red boxes. In this case, we were lucky that it nailed it at 1.2. He's nice and super tack sharp. So it worked in that situation, but you can see how it can be mentally weird when the focusing points are bouncing around and you're not sure if it's where it needs to be. In that case, it worked. But this, you gotta watch what happened right here. This is a prime example. Nails his eye right there, that's great. Let's go vertical, Jared. Here we go. Focus, hello, focus. My finger is pressed down on the button and it will not find the subject at all. It's not, and that is me trying to use the manual ring to trick it into focusing. It does not get the focus until I take a step back and then I can move forward. It was about 14 seconds of it not being able to acquire the focus. What happens if you have one opportunity to photograph someone and you've got like five seconds and you go like this and you're like, oh, it's not focusing when I go vertical. That should never happen. That's not a failure of the lens. That's a failure of the focusing system. You saw it happen. All of my settings are right. You watched it in real time. That is a fail. All right, so let's jump into that last photo right here. And it looks pretty good at 1.2, but I'm actually not sure if it's focused on the eye or somewhere on the cheek, even though the IAF was right where it should have been. When it finally hit, it was right on the eye, but it's not perfect. And, and that's the problem right here, is that this system is far from perfect. In comparison to the Canon, in comparison to the Sony, it's not even close, it's night and day. And I know this is a review, this is a lens review, it's not a body review, but your lens has to go on a body. And if the body, can't work with the lens to give you that autofocus that you deserve and that you need today, then it's an absolute fail. I'm not trying to be harsh just to be harsh. I'm setting it up with facts and showing you examples right here. So now let's move back to the lens. I love the lens. I think it's too big. What am I gonna say? It's just too big compared to every other lens that, that compared to the Sony and compared to the Canon. I don't know why it's that large. It's heavy, it takes more space up in the, in the bag. We're supposed to get smaller lenses with the larger Z mount, but it hasn't happened at this point, at least in the 1.2s. The 1.8s are nice and small. They work well, they're pretty good, but this is where we're at. Two important tests, the most important test. We've got the sniff test and the wind tunnel test. Let's see how we do here. Whoa, Jesus, it absolutely fails the wind tunnel test because it's a behemoth. If it was any smaller, it would be better. All right, let's sniff it. Oh, Scooby Snacks. It passes the sniff test. 
So again, this lens clocks in at just over 2000 it's $2,100. I think it's a fantastic lens. We already know what I think of the system. I'm hoping that the future Nikons do even better and their autofocus continues to progress. But you saw exactly what I saw. I was fighting the system the entire time that I used this. If I can't trust that I'm going to get more shots than I'm going to miss, then it's very hard to recommend a system if that's the case when even the most basic A7Cs just get the job done on Sony's side. Don't forget, you can download some sample RAW files over on the website. I really appreciate you watching. Let me know what you think down below. That's it. Jared Polinfronosphoto.com. See ya.